Welcome to Courtside, everyone, a discussion of legal issues and no Donald Trump today. It's been a very exciting week. Uh, Der the Derek Chauvin trial, where I'm serving as special prosecutor, has started. Uh, as a result, I won't really talk about it, except to say that it's been a super intense time. We've been at all three levels of the Minnesota court system, the trial court, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the trial will be continuing for the next several weeks. Uh, and the trials got me thinking about the criminal justice system more generally, and something I want to focus on today, which is this notion of cash bail. I think some of you have heard about it, maybe as a civil rights issue, but you're not sure what it is or how it works. And cash bail and the royal family have exactly two have exactly one thing in common, which is that John Oliver warned us about both of them, and we really should have done something about both sooner. So assume you're accused of a crime. Can they put you in jail right away, so-called pre-trial detention, or do you have to wait for your trial? Well, there's a long history of mechanisms that go all the way back to you know, medieval times to make sure that not everyone who's accused of a crime stays in jail until their trial. You know, that's that concept of innocent till proven guilty. And so there was always some sort of property or money that you can put up to say, let me go, I'll come back for trial. And it's grounded in constitutional concerns, like innocent till proven guilty, also grounded in the jury trial rights of the Sixth Amendment and due process and the like. And, you know, even before all of that, you know, before the Constitution, in the colonies, those accused of crimes relied on essentially a friends and family system, where they'd put up the money uh, to assure that someone would come back for trial. And this kind of personal personal surety system was basically the colonial equivalent of a GoFundMe or something like that. But as the nation developed after the Constitution, the system moved in a very dangerous direction toward more commercialization and secured money bail. And there's several different flavors of this, but the most common one is a surety bail bond in which a person who's accused of a crime agrees to put up 10% of the bail amount that they'd pay in order to get out. And then this commercial bail agent puts up the other 90%. And that bail agent uh, is responsible for the total amount if uh, someone doesn't show up at the hearing. And if you do show up, then the 10%, of course, is never returned to you. The bail agent gets it. And the bail agent all through has required friends and family of the defendant to you know, sign over some sort of collateral for the other 90%. So it's a good deal for the bail bondsman, not such a good deal for the family or for the defendant. And we stand in America pretty much alone in having a commercial bond and bail bond industry that's for profit. I think it's only the Philippines that has a similar system. Extremely unusual. Now, another part of this is so-called cash bail, which is money paid to the court. Not 10% usually, but often the full or high amount. And that money only gets returned to you if you go to attend all the court hearings. And cash bail is essentially what would happen if you took a functional criminal justice system and replaced release conditions from prison with ransom notes, because that's what it is. And we're going to do a deep dive into that in a second. But just to back up for a second, for much of the last hundred years, the Supreme Court has protected some right to bail, even in you know cases of national security, things like communists, for example. And in a case called Stack versus Boyle, the Supreme Court said the government couldn't use sky high bail amounts to keep communists from being released. Things started to change with congressional legislation, however. The Bail Reform Act of 1966 got people thinking that if they'd ultimately be found guilty, then those folks could be held pretrial for longer. And then in 1984, the Bail Reform Act went even further and looked to the likelihood of future criminality. And if someone was likely to commit another crime, then you could detain them pretrial. And the Supreme Court upheld this largely in, this, in a case called Salerno. And so today, despite the limited you know, intent, I think, of that 1984 act, pretrial detention, that is holding someone in prison when they haven't been accused of a crime, is the norm, not the exception in many places. And 
If you can afford bail, then maybe you can get out. You know, that depends state to state. And bail amounts vary nationwide a lot. For a lot of felonies, it's around $10,000. Um, and, you know, but even for lower amounts, you know, um, there are a lot of, you know, of, of bail amounts that are $500 or $250, but a lot of people can't afford those. In New York, for example, only 12% of defendants will make bail at their arraignment, even though, you know, a lot of bail is less than $1,000, but a lot of people can't afford that. And that's similarly true in Philadelphia. There was a study from 20, uh, 2008 to 2013, and nearly 40% of those with bail set at $500 or less stayed in jail for at least three days. And that's because they couldn't effectively, you know, they couldn't pay. And so bail uh, means that, you know, the money bail the requirement means that these people have to stay in prison just because they don't have the wealth that other people do. And so what does this mean? Everything sounds abstract that I've been saying. And so let me explain the deal to you. Two out of every three jail inmates in the United States are being held in pretrial detention. And many of them, because they can't pay this cash bail, they've never been convicted of a crime. And yet they have to stay there. And the burden doesn't fall equally across society. African-American men are significantly more likely than white men to be arrested without engaging in illegal activity. And then when you get to who can pay the bail and who can't, you see those same effects. So in large urban areas, African-American felony defendants are more than 25% more likely than white defendants to be held pre-trial. And across the country, minority defendants are 10 to 25% more likely to be detained pre-trial. Young African-American men are about 50% more likely to be t detained pre-trial than white defendants. And minority defendants receive bail amounts that are often twice as high as bail set for white defendants. And of course, they're less likely to be able to afford it. So forcing people to pay their way out of jail is so messed up that even the game Monopoly, a game literally named after an illegal business practice, lets you out if you roll doubles. And for a long time, we've known the severe consequences of this bail system for employment, for example. You know, pretrial detainees, if you're detained pretrial, even if you're ultimately acquitted, found innocent at the trial, it's still hard to employ you. There was a study done in the American Economic Review that found this, that found it both for employment, but also for the earned income tax credit or even for unemployment insurance. If you're a pretrial detainee, much, much harder. And over the last year, we've learned something far more tragic, unfortunately. The pandemic has brought this home. And let me just talk about Texas for a minute, where 231 people have died from coronavirus in Texas's correctional facilities. And there was a recent study done, and it found of those 231 people, 80% of them were in pretrial detention. They hadn't been convicted of a crime. They were there waiting for trial and they couldn't afford the bail. The 231 people who've died from coronavirus is likely an undercount given autopsy rates and the like. And look, you know, Ted Cruz can scream freedom at the top of his lungs at CPAC and all these conventions he goes to, but he scarcely bats an eye when people who are presumed innocent under our system face death sentences in Texas jails. People who've never been convicted of a crime but are forced into these facilities where coronavirus runs rampant. This is literally a matter of life and death. And yet, it turns on your wealth. If you have enough, you have some sort of get out of jail card. And that's why I'm so glad, and this is one of the inspirations for doing this today, that my birth state, Illinois, is the first state to do away entirely with this system. Now judges will no longer, because of legislation, be able to set any kind of bail for a defendant charged with a crime. Pre-trial detention instead is going to look to risk of the defendant, not their wealth. Accused people can be detained pre-trial in Illinois, of course, but they're going to look for whether or not someone's going to willfully flee from the jurisdiction or if they're a real and present threat to the safety of some person or something like that. And that is a big step forward in getting rid of this horrible bail bond industry. Um, I mean, bail bond companies are so comically evil that even the state legislature of Illinois was like, 
uh, no, you can't pay me enough to defend that. And the public safety argument on the other side, I don't think holds water. Uh, my good friend Mike Novogratz in New York has a bail fund where he literally pays people's bail. And turns out almost everyone comes back when he pays, when he pays their bail. They come back for court hearings. And the D.C. experience shows this as well, because Washington, D.C. actually got rid of money bail back in 1992. And today it releases 94 percent of the people who've been accused of crimes as they're awaiting their court hearings. And of those people, 88 percent return for court and 2 percent were arrested for violent crime as they awaited court hearings. It's not to say there aren't consequences and costs to getting rid of cash bail. But the idea that in an American system that your freedom turns literally on how much money you have in your wallet, that can't be possibly a right way to think about criminal justice. And, you know, so the D.C. experience is, I think, instructive. And the fact that Illinois is getting credit right now is the first state to do this and get rid of cash bail when D.C. has already gotten rid of it for two decades really adds insult to injury on the whole D.C. statehood front. Let me end today by telling you something inspiring, and it's about Harris County in Texas, Texas's largest county. My nonprofit, ICAP, the Institute for Constitutional Accountability and Protection at Georgetown, joined the litigation to get rid of cash bail in Harris County as discriminatory a few years ago. And we represented a whole bunch of former prosecutors and explained how, in our brief, how cash bail was discriminatory and didn't work. That brief, we wrote, was signed by, among others, Kim Oak, the incumbent district attorney, the chief prosecutor in Harris County. And as a result of the litigation and other things, Harris County did away with cash bail for low-level crimes. And we've now had two years of experience under this and tens of thousands of people awaiting their trials for misdemeanors and the like have been freed. And the question is, does it increase you know, arrests for new crimes? It turns out letting these folks around, out has not increased the chance that they'd be arrested for new crimes. And in fact, the percentage of defendants arrested for new crimes within a year of their original arrest went down, not up, after the county changed its bail practices. So there is a path forward. Harris County shows the way. The District of Columbia shows the way. And the state of Illinois shows the way. I'll see you next week.